ทำนามาแล้วหกปีเพราะว่าหลังจากที่ผมบวชเสร็จก็ศึกแล้วก็ทำนาเพราะว่าอาชีพอย่างเดียวคือทำนาชีวิตการเป็นชาวนานี่ลำ,ลำบากครับเพราะว่าที่นี่นะเพราะว่าไม่ไม่มีน้ำขาดแหล่งน้ำที่เพียงพอไม่ต้องการใช้น้ำฝนโดยตลอดการทำนาก็มีอุปสรรคบ้างถ้าปีไหนมีน้ำฝนตกตามฤดูกาลก็ได้ผลผลิตดีถ้าปีไหนฝนไม่ตกตามฤดูกาลก็ไม่ผลผลิตไม่ได้เพราะคนที่ลงทุนไปแล้วก็ขาดทุนอ๋อต้องต้องเหนื่อยเหนื่อยมากทำเยอะครับช่วงทำนานี่ต้องหลังจากวันแล้วเข้าขึ้นต้องดูแลดูแลว่าวัดชะพืชอะไรทั้งทุกสิ่งทุกอย่างอ๋อให้สนุกก็ไม่สนุกเท่าไหร่แต่คือว่าเป็นอาชีพแต่ต้องถือว่าเป็นอาชีพต้องทำเต็มที่เพื่อให้ได้ผลผลิตที่ดีที่สุดนะ This is a picture of what Thailand used to look like A landscape of subsistence farming, where farmers grew enough food to feed their families, all the while facing enormous risks with weather, crop growth, and other forces beyond their control. Subsistence farming is often what poverty looks like on the ground, both in Thailand and throughout the world. But in the past two decades, Thailand and other Asian countries have experienced explosive growth. Why have these economies grown so quickly? What has led to a more productive national economy? If we go back in time to the 1960s or certainly earlier, and you were flying over Thailand in an airplane, you would see most of the ground cover would be either forest or planted in rice. Then, over the years, the agricultural sector starts to diminish in importance, and they would convert these rice paddies to to fish ponds and shrimp ponds. That's the voice of MIT economist Robert Townsend. As Townsend observed the economic changes and industrialization in Thailand, he wondered if the daily choices individuals made had an impact on regional and national growth, or if these individuals were simply part of a process beyond their control. The role that entrepreneurial households play in wealth creation and poverty alleviation has never been fully explored. Ideally, researchers could simply ask households for information and come away with a clear picture of wealth and poverty. But if this isn't done methodically, for many households and over a long period of time, one ends up with merely anecdotal information. We felt that we really didn't know what was going on in these villages, that we would have to go in there and really interview people and systematically write down what they were saying and then track them over a period of time in order to understand the, the true story of village life. Though it would be an enormous, daunting, and sweeping task, this effort had the potential to glean incredibly important data for analysis. And it's exactly what Townsend set out to do. Comprehensive, long-running surveys with thousands of households across Thailand. The whole point is to have a live, active database. It's not just the data that we've been collecting. It's understanding the data as a measurement of the lives of these households. Townsend knew that he would need a strong and extensive team on the ground to conduct the surveys for research. So he turned to his friend and Thai collaborator. สมบัติสกุลตาเสถียรชื่อสมบัติสกุลตาเสถียรก็เป็นผู้อำนวยการโครงการวิจัยนะชื่อโครงการวิจัยครอบครัวไทย Together they created the Thai Family Research Project or TFRP a survey effort with over 70 employees dedicated to collecting data on households in cities and villages throughout Thailand They returned to the same households month after month and year after year to interview heads of households on their economic situations. คือในการเก็บข้อมูลเนี่ยงานวิจัยชิ้นนี้เป็นงานที่เราทํากับกับคนกับชาวบ้านสิ่งที่สําคัญที่สุดคือเราจะคํานึงถึงความรู้สึกความนึกคิดของของคนของชาวบ้านเป็นหลักเราไม่พยายามที่จะ
คล้ายๆบังคับเขาให้ตอบข้อมูลกับเราแต่เราพยายามที่จะกระตุ้นเขาในการให้ความร่วมมือกับเราเพราะนั้นจุดนี้จะเป็นจุดยากที่ยากมากนะเพราะว่าพื้นที่จํานวนโครเรือนที่เราทําเนี่ยเป็นจํานวนมากแล้วพื้นที่เนี่ยมันเป็นทุกภาคของประเทศซึ่งมีความแตกต่างทางด้านวัฒนธรรม They ask questions about who lives in the household, if and where they are working, if they produce goods, if they use financial services, if they have faced hardship and how they have dealt with it. They also ask a series of unique questions that allow researchers to construct economic models and test economic theory. The Townsend Thai data gathered by TFRP has become the longest-running panel survey in a developing country. Collecting annual and monthly data since 1997, and as a result, Townsend and his collaborators have uncovered the intricate details of daily life by tracing individuals' relationships to villages, regions, and even the Thai economy as a whole. We're learning about the national level growth process by looking at what happens at the individual and village level. Amassing such a large amount of raw data led to a major conceptual stumbling block for Townsend and his colleagues. How could they make sense of all the data they were collecting in order to learn something reliable and meaningful? They would need to be able to compare financial performance across households engaged in different activities throughout various parts of the country. One has to have a framework to look at the data. You don't know what to search for otherwise. You would just get. Confounded with all the many details, the discovery really came as we traveled back home, deeply engaged in this conversation about how do we measure income. And then we realized that no one had actually systematically tried to use the financial accounts to organize survey data. What the researchers discovered was that they could view these household businesses the same as they would view any corporation in the developed world. Traditionally in economics, households are viewed as labor suppliers and consumers. They are not treated as producers of goods or services, despite the fact that small household enterprises in developing countries can actually account for large amounts of production. So, using the data to track the financial transactions of these household businesses, Townsend and his colleagues were able to create income statements, balance sheets, and cash flow statements comparable to those of a corporation. The realization that we should and could do this was very exciting to us. It seemed simple-minded, but actually, we had to decide which categories in the data constitute income and which don't. In order to organize the data into standard financial accounts, Townsend and his team took a closer look at a typical Thai business, for example, that of a fisherman. If this fisherman in the province of Satun used some of his profits from the previous year to purchase a new fishing boat, this boat could be considered an investment in his business. In the financial accounts, this boat would be reflected as an increase in the assets on his balance sheet and in his overall wealth. The fish he would catch every day would be his production and considered income in the accounts. The money he would receive from selling the fish at market. Would show up as a cash inflow. Of course, his family would also eat some of the fish he caught. This kind of transaction would be analogous to a stockholder payout or a dividend, as it's referred to in the corporate world. Many households in Thailand have multiple businesses under one roof, making the accounting more complex. Say, for example, our fisherman also owns a restaurant in the market. Some of the fish he catches is prepared and served as a meal to patrons. In this case, the fresh fish would appear on the income statement as an output in revenue from the fishing business, and as an input and expense into the restaurant. The exchange of fish between the two businesses would have no effect on the fisherman's cash flow, but the ready-cooked fish sold to customers would be both income and a cash inflow. We can see the complexity Townsend faced in trying to understand household businesses and the need to create detailed financial accounts. Something as simple as fish 
can potentially fit into multiple categories for this household, depending on how it is used. It took us three years uh, to accomplish this. So roughly 720 households are associated with these complete set of financial accounts. With accounts in hand, researchers can make unprecedented comparisons across household businesses. Fishermen, shopkeepers, and factory owners are all on the same footing. Researchers can now determine if households face risks or have cash shortages that keep them from running their businesses, expanding their businesses, or paying off their debt. More importantly, they can distinguish these short-term issues related to cash flow from long-term issues that relate to an individual's productivity. We can actually see the mechanics of, of how wealth is increasing or potentially decreasing over time. I mean, the idea here is to really understand the nuts and bolts of the financial system, from the very small households up to the national level. Now that the team had a framework in place, they were able to see just how well these individuals were doing with their businesses. Together, the numbers began to tell a detailed story of entrepreneurial success. Uh, the very successful households make substantial profits. Through the research, we have documented that a household that is successful in a given year is very likely to continue to be successful in subsequent years. So Townsend's team began to ask a new series of detailed questions to better understand where the success was coming from. Were households simply getting lucky, or were they doing something methodical that led their businesses to prosper? ปัจจุบันนั้นขยายออกมาเป็นสิบแปดตัวก็เลี้ยงเราก็ดูพัฒนาไปเรื่อยๆพัฒนาสายพันธุ์พอเอาสายพันธุ์ผสมเราจะเ
We mean it's not that they just got lucky year after year after year and happened to have high sales because some random group of people came into their shop and not into other people's shops. No, it's not that. It's something the individual is doing. It's something about how the individual is running his or her own business. And part of it clearly is related to their personality, to their ability, not narrowly just education. Townsend's research also suggests that poor people who skillfully manage their assets are especially successful in improving their net worth. These households generate higher profits and also save more of what they make. The team compared rich and poor households over a seven-year period and found that the rich household's wealth grew by only 0.09% per year, while the poor households averaged 22% growth. And some of the most successful of these poor households increased their worth by up to 32% per year. Many of the successful households reinvested their profits in their small businesses and farms, suggesting they were well aware of the source of their success. There are some households with very high rates of return. They probably could and would use more credit, but there are many other households who should not be running businesses and should be doing something else with their money. Understanding the specific factors that make a household successful would allow for the tailored support of these talented individuals and pave the way for a new set of solutions to the problems of poverty in the developing world. Townsend and his team had established that successful households were doing something right with their businesses, but they realized that it was not just the individual's decisions that were driving success, that perhaps their communities had something to do with it as well. The question was, how did these village and neighborhood economies operate financially, and how did the community factor into the success of these households? So the researchers turned to the data they realized that they could track networks through the financial transactions taking place in and across villages. We can see who's giving gifts to whom, when they lend to each other. We have both the borrower and the lender. We have the indirect connections as well. So we actually see sort of networks working in practice. Hoping to gain more insight into these financial networks, the team hit the ground to ask more detailed questions about what role these village networks played in the lives of the people running small businesses. My name is Najarat Thangen. I'm a business owner. I'm in the village of Buriram. And my house is about 710 people. And I'm from Buriram. 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 เทศกาลการท่องเที่ยวต่างๆนะครับช่วงที่ขายไม่ดีมันก็มันก็มีอยู่บ้างนะครับมันก็การแบ่งปันนะครับหรือว่าเวลาตกทุกข์ได้ย
ลูกก็มีอยู่สามคนลูกไส้ใหญ่เพื่อนก็เอาเพื่อนที่บ้านนี่แหละเพื่อนมาสวยเพื่อนว่าพ่อบ้านก็เสียตั้งแต่พ่อซอหาซิเพื่อนก็ว่าบ่มีพ่อบ้านเพื่อนก็มาซอยหนาหนาเพื่อนแถวๆออกมอบนี่เพื่อนก็มาซอยเมื่อมีคนทําเพื่อนก็มาสวยสู่เพื่อนอยู่ยามทําหน้าไม่จากเราก็ได้ใส่น้ําลูกสาวลูกเขยลูกไส้ช่วยทำทำในครอบครัวมีแรงช่วยบ้างมีเงินช่วยบ้างเขายืมหนึ่งพันเก้าพันหนึ่งคือเก่าบ่มีดอกยืมแต่ยืมเปล่าๆแหละคนได้คนในบ้านเนาะคนในบ้านเพื่อนเดียวกันครอบครัวเดียวกันคือหน่องสาวคือพี่สาวให้อยู่ซื้อผ้าถุงซื้อเสื้อมาให้ใส่แหละน้องมูน้องสาวพี่สาวเพิ่งกับคือเพิ่งให้ Traditionally, gift giving occurs without the expectation of receiving something in return. But for many in these villages, the act of gift giving can be seen as one business supporting another. If the gifts are not income, then what are they exactly? We decided that. Gifts are a bit like financing. It's as if informally the household had received money for selling implicit shares in the enterprise. So we view gifts as an implicit claim on the return stream of the household's assets, just the way a firm would issue uh, shares, acquire money for financing that way, and then have some obligation to pay dividends in the future. มันก็ดีเป็นคนละแบบนะครับถ้าว่าสามารถที่จะยืมในหมู่บ้านได้ก็ในหมู่บ้านก็จะดีกว่าครับเพราะว่าบางคนในหมู่บ้านมันก็ถ้าไม่มีหลักทรัพย์มันก็เข้าถึงระบบธนาคารไม่ได้ครับ They have developed methods for giving credit that are well suited to the agrarian life in these villages more so than more distant commercial banks who often either are not there or Don't really understand the life of the farmers. Typically, outsiders do not understand exactly how local communities work. In the past, governments have tried to get rid of money lenders, assuming that informal lending preys on the poor. But the team's research suggests otherwise. These financial risk-sharing networks are working surprisingly well for a good number of people. There are. Poor people who have a lot of family around, so that when they run into emergencies, they can get those gifts and short-term loans. So they don't suffer in terms of having to reduce critical consumption expenditures. But there are households in villages that do not have any family around. In our research, they are shown to be the most vulnerable group. They do have to reduce their consumption in a bad year. They're constrained in their investment, so there's kind of a missing financial infrastructure on the low end. And if we could improve that, hopefully through partnerships, if not government programs, we think we would see an increase in welfare and well-being and and improve productivity. This implies that to be truly effective, policy should not necessarily interfere with traditional systems that already work well. For a number of people, rather they should integrate these systems into the larger national economy, while helping the most vulnerable individuals who lack access to these community support networks. So, just how are these households and villages connected to the national economy? Townsend's original observation of Thailand's changing landscape, from one of subsistence agriculture to more developed commercial and industrial areas, was that these changing landscapes represented something major at play: that these households were changing occupations in order to be more profitable. ชื่อในจำลองนามสกุลวรพินอาชีพเกษตรกรจังหวัดนครปฐมเมื่อก่อนก็ทํานาแต่ก่อนทํานาก็เศรษฐกิจที่ที่ก้าวแล้วเมื
ตอนที่ทำช่วงที่ทำนะครับต้องทำเองขับรถถ่ายเองถ่ายนาเองวานเองคาดเองอะไรทุกอย่างทำวันไม่มีเวลาหยุดเลยเลี้ยงกุ้งแต่ว่ากุ้งสบายฝ่าแต่ลงทุนมากฝ่าเสี่ยงฝ่าเพราะมันใช้แรงงานน้อยใช้สมองนิดหน่อยมันมันแตกต่างกันเยอะมันก็เลยเคยชินไม่อยากกลับไปทำอีกเพราะมันมันก็ทำมาประมาณยี่สิบปีก็ความเป็นอยู่ก็ดีขึ้น At the household level, one sees rice farmers converting their land into fish ponds. One sees rice farmers potentially selling their land and setting up a small business. So there are people farming rice who are actually talented for running businesses. We are trying to identify those people. Uh, some of them are the success stories. They have managed this transition, and it shows up in what they do and in the data that we gathered. Indeed, talented households that switched from agricultural activities to better fitted occupations in small business and manufacturing were able to expand their businesses and hire labor. They were ultimately more productive and created more wealth for themselves and employment opportunities and higher wages for others. We see these transitions. From traditional activities to more innovative and higher profit activities, and this shows up, of course, at the national level in terms of GDP. GDP, or gross domestic product, is a measure of a nation's income in a given year. By looking at the household financial accounts, the researchers could accurately see just how much these small businesses were contributing to national income and productivity. There's a temptation to think that emerging market countries that are successful are countries where they are industrializing, that output is coming from large factories, as in Thailand, say, Nike or Ford Motors. And what's going on in villages is irrelevant to that process. Townsend discovered that even though these household businesses were relatively small, when combined, they were not irrelevant at all. In fact, their contribution to the nation's GDP was actually higher than the contributions of large corporate enterprises combined. At the height of Thailand's growth in the mid-90s, household enterprises accounted for 30% of national income, more than double that of corporate profits. A similar story of household-led growth was found when researchers looked at the country's overall productivity. National productivity is often viewed as arising from innovations in technology. When technology improves, each existing resource can be used in a better way and therefore produce more. However, this does not traditionally account for small firms or households. Townsend's contribution was to factor these individuals into the bigger picture. His research showed that through occupational shifts. Facilitated by increased access to savings and loans from banking institutions, these individuals substantially contributed to the nation's productivity. In fact, Townsend and his colleagues were able to show that 73% of Thailand's national productivity growth over a period of two decades can be explained by individuals shifting occupations. When households shift occupations in order to do what they are best at, they are using their talents and skills in a more productive way. For some, that means running businesses and hiring workers. For others, it means quitting their struggling businesses and putting their money into savings that can be channeled through financial institutions to become credit for successful businesses trying to grow. Through these shifts, we not only see the households with a better standard of living. But also a growing and more productive national economy, comprised of small and growing businesses and a more efficient financial system. After years of intensive research and in-depth examination of Thailand's fascinating and often flourishing economy, what Townsend has discovered 
is that to truly understand what drives the economies of the developing world, one must account for the countless households and communities within, both rich and poor. The choices individuals make and the way communities operate can have a real impact on the growth of a country. Solutions and policies should flow from an understanding of these households and communities instead of from a one-size-fits-all assessment of a country's economy. This is a thrilling and promising thought, for it shows us that if we can identify what makes individuals and communities successful, then we can tailor solutions that will help bolster that success. Making the lives of poor people better is not only beneficial in its own right, but also contributes significantly to the growth of the entire nation. We want to give back to these households something in return for what they have given us over the years. Their incredible patience and endurance in answering our questions month after month, year after year. We have a sense of understanding. We have a sense of hope that we can see that the people of the country will change in the future. Right? The children will change in the future. ไปเป็นยังไงใช้ชีวิตยังไงแล้วงานศึกษาอันนี้ผมคิดว่าทําอย่างไรมันถึงจะให้ทางทางรัฐบาลหรือทางส่วนงานเนี่ยได้มีโอกาสมารับรู้นะเข้ามาร่วมกับเราในการที่จะนําข้อมูลเหล่านี้ไปหาทางในการที่จะช่วยเหลือชาวบ้านเพราะเราเองเป็นนักวิจัยเราไม่ใช่นักพัฒนานะก็หวังอย่างยิ่งว่าข้อมูลอันนี้น่าจะเป็นประโยชน์นอกจากการศึกษาแล้วก็น่าจะเป็นประโยชน์ต่อการที่รัฐบาลไปใช้ในการกำหนดนโยบายการพัฒนา We currently are using the data that they've given us and the models and the conceptual frameworks to identify current obstacles that we think could potentially be removed We hope to help them by facilitating this transition speeding it up and helping the innovation and we think the households themselves can be part of that.